Adam Ajang, uh, and the Secretary General of the United Nations, Special Advisor of the Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide, former Registrar of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Describe what you saw when you first started with the ICTR. When I joined the ICTR, it was a time when there was a lot of tension between the Registrar and the uh, president of the tribunal. Uh, as you may know, uh, managing a tribunal, uh, international criminal tribunal, was not an easy task. Uh, and uh, when I joined it, uh, I managed to really uh, establish very close relation with the judges. And of course, with the president, we used to have a weekly meeting so that to iron any potential problem. Uh, and I should say that uh, this was uh, much welcome, including by the General Assembly, adopting a resolution welcoming the improvement in the management of the tribunal. That is not to say that my predecessor didn't deliver. I should say that he did a wonderful work, which I built from uh, to really make the tribunal what it became later. And that may explain why I became the longest serving registrar of any international criminal tribunal. I have spent almost 12 years. What's a, what, what motivated you in, in, in your work? I should say that uh, I have devoted almost my entire life to the fight against impunity. Before joining the ICTR, I was the Secretary General of the International Commission of Jurists, an institution which, in fact, was campaigning for the establishment of the International Criminal Court. And I published, at the time, an important report called No to Impunity, Yes for Justice. And at the World Congress of Human Rights in Vienna, I was trumpeting throughout the walls of the Vienna Congress the need to have a paragraph in that declaration that was until late in the night at the time of the adoption of that, that finally they agreed to have a small reference to the, regarding the ICC. And of course, I should add that uh, having been also the independent expert of the United Nations for Haiti six years, I was very keen to see really impunity also being fought uh, in uh, Haiti. But regarding Rwanda, I was the last person to be met by the then President Habyari Mana at the palace. That was the 2nd of April 1994. The 1st of April I was in Malindi where I met with the leadership of the Rwandan Patriotic Front. And I can say that I was already very much concerned about what would happen in Rwanda. There were crimes being committed the months before the genocide started. And uh, it was, to me, I would say no surprise that uh, after the crash of the plane of President Habyari Mana, things started. I remember giving interviews to uh, the uh, Radio France, to the BBC, uh, following the crash of the plane, and uh, saying that one of the messages I delivered at that time to President Habyari Mana was to make sure that impunity be fought. Unfortunately, he returned from Dar es Salaam and he never, of course, was able to implement what he committed to do. But I should say that for me, it was really a privilege uh, to be appointed in that position. And it was a kind of a continuation of what I was doing with the International Commission of Juries. And today, what I'm doing as the Special Advisor of the Secretary General, I see it also as a continuation of what I have done in Arusha. So from uh, the uh, repression, which was here delivering justice to the victims of genocide, today I'm trying to prevent genocide to occur around the world. And I can say that I have built uh, from the lessons learned in ICTR, the history of the Rwandan genocide, the genocide of the Tutsis uh, in Rwanda, during which Hutu moderate and others who opposed the genocide were killed. So uh, 
I think we have to learn those lessons. And the ICTR has made a tremendous contribution in the development of international criminal law. Uh, and I should say that during my tenure, I was able uh, to bring a lot of innovation in the ICTR. For instance, uh, the introduction of the real-time uh, uh, reporting, uh, which enabled the tribunal to save 25% of the time spent in courtroom. I was able uh, to uh, train also key uh, interpreters uh, to do simultaneous interpretation into Kenya Rwanda. It lasted almost a year, but this was really extremely important. And regarding also the movement of witnesses, which is extremely important, because we brought near 3,000 witnesses from all around the world. And at a time, this was extremely difficult because most of those witnesses uh, wouldn't have uh, the travel document. Some of them were, uh, had refugee status, others were living uh, illegally in countries. And this is, uh, I would say, uh, something which I will remember. Because thanks to the cooperation extended to the tribunal by many countries, and particularly from within Africa, we were able to bring those witnesses. In Rwanda, of course, the witnesses coming from Rwanda, most of them were witnesses for the prosecutor. But even there also, we thought witnesses who may at a time be uh, threatened. Uh, so, uh, and I salute it, the cooperation extended to the tribunal by Rwanda in terms of ensuring the protection of those witnesses. But also there were defense witnesses who at a time were also threatened elsewhere in other countries and I was able to secure their uh, safety. And uh, another important aspect during my tenure was the signing of agreement of cooperation for the enforcement of sentences. And this has enabled the ICTR uh, to uh, transfer its convicts into many prison facilities uh, in Mali, in Benin, uh, and uh, in, uh, there will be also uh, convicts who will be transferred to Senegal. Uh, another important aspect uh, during my tenure, which uh, I would also uh, echo, was the building of a clinic in Kigali. Uh, because I was a bit frustrated to see that the international community did not provide uh, a room for uh, the compensation of the victims of the, the genocide. And I was extremely moved when the first time I visited Kigali after my uh, appointment, after I was being sworn in as a registrar, uh, the meeting witnesses who were counting the stories they went through being raped, uh, and the most, I would say, horrific his stories. But at the same time, I was so, uh, I would say, humbled by the uh, bravery of those witnesses. And when I realized that some of them were HIV infected as a result of the rape, they were uh, the victim, I decided to raise funds and to build a small clinic in Kigali, which was able to provide uh, not only the uh, medicine but for those victims, but also to their family, their relatives. That was, to me, extremely important. Uh, and another, I think, dimension we should also bear in mind was that thanks to the ICTR, uh, we were able to introduce the new technology we had in this tribunal into some national jurisdiction, starting with Rwanda, of course, but also in Tanzania. Uh, and we uh, were able also to provide support to a country like Kenya in terms of uh, uh, formulating uh, the needs for a witness protection unit. Uh, this is simply to say that uh, the ICTR, after 21 years of existence, can claim to be a successful tribunal. Of course, ICTR has faced so many criticisms in terms of the delay in uh, delivering a judgment. But that was totally wrong because people had to realize that ICTR started from scratch and also had to realize, as I said, uh, that 
we needed to bring people from all around the world, needed to translate from English to French, from Kenya, Rwanda, things which you will not see in other tribunals. And what made me so happy was one day, one journalist who was living in Kigali, whose entire family was killed during the genocide. The day the person accused was convicted to serve a life imprisonment, the remind of his life, he called me and said, from day one, I will be the advocate of the ICTR. To me, this day is a memorable day. To me, justice has no price. If the ICTR has costed hundred billions of dollars, to me, that is deserved. Because today, I can rest in peace because simply justice has been done. And I think that is also what prompted the international community in November 1994 to establish the ICTR, that international community which failed the Rwandan people in 1994, which was not able to prevent, to prevent the genocide to happen. They established this tribunal, which was another way of really uh, recognizing their failure. And most importantly, 10 years down the road, drawing the lessons of that failure, the United Nations decided to establish my mandate, the mandate of the Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide. So at the same time, we have seen in December 9, 2013, the United Nations opening its gate in Juba, allowing people to come in. And thanks to that opening the doors, 10,000 of people were saved. This was not the case in 1994, where the doors of the UN were closed, where the military troops left uh, Kigali. So that is to say that thanks to the international community, thanks to the generous cooperation extended to the tribunal by the international community, by many member states, we can say justice has been done. We can say today that the memory of the victims of the genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda, during which Hutu moderate, Tuwa and others who opposed the genocide were killed, their memory today is alive, and I think those victims today can rest in peace. What has your work with the ICTR taught you? Well, that uh, genocide is a process. Genocide doesn't happen overnight. Genocide requires planning, it requires timing, it requires resources. And I think that I learned from the ICTR that we can therefore prevent genocide because we can see the early sign of the factors which can lead to the commission of the crime of genocide. Had we were able to identify those risk factors, we could have certainly, by taking a timely and decisively action, we could have stopped the genocide which was committed in uh, Rwanda. So that is, I think, an important lesson. Another lesson I have learned uh, is that where you have a political will to fight against impunity, you can make it. And that is why I was extremely pleased uh, listening uh, through a European uh, channel, uh, uh, Judge Theodore Meron, who was speaking about international criminal justice and saying that at the end of the day, we in the International Criminal Tribunal, we are here to deliver justice and we don't have to care about what politicians may want. What we have to do is simply to look into our books and make sure that the standards are respected, that the trial is fair, and then render our justice. But another important aspect I learned also is that it is important that justice be uh, uh, seen being done. In other words, 
the closer uh, the uh, 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 to the scene of the crime uh, is the justice being done the better it is uh, and in that regard although uh, the uh, scene of the crime was in Rwanda but being Arusha being close to Rwanda sent a strong signal so it was possible to have uh, regularly a link between uh, Arusha and Kigali uh, I was able to get a satellite so that any time a judgment was being delivered, this was being immediately reported uh, in live in uh, Rwanda. So I think that is something we have uh, noticed as being an important dimension in international criminal justice, the outreach, outreach. I mean, we need to make sure that the victims of the crime know exactly what has been done from the tribunal. Looking back with the benefit of hindsight now, is, is, is there anything that you wish the ICTR could have done differently, lessons that we know now that future uh, tribunals might, might be able to, to integrate as they move forward? The issue of the victims the reparation and compensation for victims is something we have ready to bear in mind. And hopefully, at the time the Rome Treaty establishing the International Criminal Court was established, they integrated that dimension. And therefore, before the International Criminal Court, the victims have a role and a place. Another important aspect also, which to my view is extremely important, is that from day one, to make sure that you have the rules of procedures and evidence which can facilitate this move uh, trial, which was not obvious from the beginning, because as I said, everything was from scratch. I do remember that the uh, first indictment was signed in a hotel room. So to say that there was nothing. Arusha was a small, tiny city where hardly sometimes you would have electricity. So those lessons also we can learn from ICTR is that efforts have to be made to fight impunity at the national level. Because when we speak about atrocity crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. These are crimes which are international crimes and which concern not only the state where they occur, but it concerns the entire world. And just to illustrate, whenever this situation occurs, you will see hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to protect their lives. And that means that situation impact also in other states. Look today, uh, when you look, for instance, what happened in Nigeria with Boko Haram, when you look what happening, what is happening in the Middle East, in Syria, with the uh, ISIS attacks, these uh, psychopaths, what does it make happening? Millions of people fleeing Syria. And we saw it even coming to Europe. And we are, we have to realize that atrocity crimes are so serious that we better make sure that whenever we see the early signs, we take action to prevent it to spread. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that particular challenge of, of um keeping things on track while being mindful of and respectful of, of, of differing ways of operating uh, different cultures? Well, in December 2014, I launched it uh, in the presence of the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Jan Eliasson, uh, the framework of analysis uh, for the prevention of atrocity crimes which is a tool for prevention. Uh, this document is an extremely important document, which was uh, drafted based on the history 
of uh, uh, genocide crimes against humanity which happen throughout the world. And I did use the service of historian, academics, lawyers, social scientists, etc. And we were able to identify 14 risk factors regarding all these atrocity crimes. And then we had identified two specific risk factors for each of those categories of crime, two for the genocide, two for, the crime, for crimes against humanity, and two for war crimes. And coming to genocide, what, for instance, is specific to genocide? That, for instance, the intent to exterminate a group simply either for its religion, its race, its nationality, or its ethnic, as we saw in the case of Rwanda. So which means uh, that genocide is the ultimate form, I would say, of discrimination. Genocide is an identity-based conflict. It is a result of the uh, uh, lack of is the result of exclusion. And that's why one of the important aspects I do really insist whenever I meet leaders of this world is to encourage the constructive management of diversity. Because at the end of the day, we can be uh, either a European, an African, we can be a Tutsi, a Hutu, a Fula, it doesn't matter. We are simply human beings. And we have to respect the diversity. You have to respect the religion of the order. You have to respect this person because of who he or she is. Because of the genocide, you are not killed because of what you have done, but you are being killed because of who you are. And this is simply unacceptable. This is the most horrendous crime. When we see today what is happening uh, against the Yazidi community in uh, Iraq, where Daesh has been targeting this community simply because of its religion. I have been visiting uh, members of that community. I visited that temple in Lalish. I met with their spiritual leader. And the stories they told me, those stories were simply horrible. And I hope that uh, sooner or later uh, their case will be brought before the International Criminal Court so that that jurisdiction will make a legal determination if to determine whether the crime of genocide was committed against the Yazidi community. There is likely a possibility that such a conclusion might be reached because I can say that the physical element of the genocide crime are there and the intent element definitely will have to be determined by an international court or even by a national court. And uh, uh, one thing we have to really realize is that our world is today not being threatened by what Huntington called the clashes of civilization, but our world is under the threat of the clashes of ignorances. Unless we try to know each other better, you, the Muslim, you have to know better the Christian and respect the Christian. You, the uh, fuller, you have to respect the order, respect his uh, culture, religion. That is those efforts we have to make. We have to, therefore, uh, look into history and uh, embark upon a strong program of education, education to Holocaust education to the prevention of genocide. If we manage to have those elements into the curricula around the world, I think we would have achieved already a lot in our fight against uh, uh, this type of uh, crimes. And I'm sure that will help us uh, to really uh, f bring back our humanity. Because what we have seen today in part of the world is the barbarity, the inhumanity we have seen, for instance, with Daesh. One day people will say, well, we never see such a people, such barbaric people who were being 
putting even their crimes in a video in a way which will compete with the best filmmaker of Hollywood. But unfortunately, that is not fiction. That is reality. And we have to fight against those scourges. We have to make sure that we respect diversity. The respect of diversity will be the foundation for a world of peace. I think history will definitely acknowledge that despite the uh, difficulties met by the ICTR in its early years, the ICTR ended by becoming really a reference in international criminal justice. Because thanks to the ICTR, one of the most serious crime, the crime of genocide, was, uh, was uh, adjudicated here in Arusha. And uh, thanks to the ICTR, the crime of uh, rape committed under certain circumstances was equated as genocide. And I think we can uh, cite a numerous achievement of this tribunal, and I think that is what history will retain. And uh, ultimately, we have seen already, uh, even before the ICTR closed its door, that its jurisprudence has been extensively used by many courts around the world, including even in the ICC. So the judgment of uh, history will definitely be a judgment very positive a judgment of satisfaction. And I'm sure, as I said, many Rwandan who at a time were, I would say, very critical about the ICTR. Today, if you ask them, they will say, thanks to the ICTR, justice has been done.